Okay, good morning and good afternoon. Um, so we are, my name is Rachel Cotton. I'm a senior associate with Cascadia Partners joined by my colleague, Alex Steinberger. And we are gonna walk you through um, what we're calling the under the hood demo um, within urban footprint for the scenario planning work we're doing for the Flagstaff regional plan update. Um, and I'll turn it over to Alex to begin the presentation. Just a few housekeeping things. Um, we're recording this meeting. So for those who are not able to attend, there'll be a recording that um, we work uh, to distribute after the meeting. And then as questions come up, uh, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. You can also raise your hand and we can unmute you um, if you'd like to ask your question verbally, but we'll be monitoring the chat um, throughout the presentation and stop for questions. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Alex. Hey everyone, uh, good morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Alex Steinberger. I'm a uh, managing partner with Cascadia Partners. And uh, I wanna talk a little bit before we get into the specifics of the, the um, scenario planning work for the regional plan about what scenario planning is, for those who don't know. Um, scenario planning is a discipline in planning where you consider multiple possible futures, uh, test ideas before settling on a uh, preferred uh, scenario that it becomes the basis of the plan. Um, and I've been doing this work all over the country for a little over 10 years and um, uh, excited to be to be doing it for, for Flagstaff. And I think the purpose of today's conversation is to provide a little bit more detail about the technical aspects of how we're doing that. Uh, we've gotten some questions about uh, the assumptions that we're using, the tools that we're using. And so today is just meant to be kind of an open discussion about what, what those all are. We have a little bit of, of presentation for you to walk you through those things, uh, but, but then we are just gonna be available to you to, to answer questions as they come up. Next slide. So an important distinction to understand is that the results that come out of a scenario planning tool, scenarios, they're not plans. They are not fully fledged uh, ways to, to structure your comprehensive or regional plan. They're just, we call them crash test dummies sometimes. We learn what we can from them and then we, we move on. So it's important not to get too attached to them as uh, some complete set of answers for us to act on. Um, they're, they're just, they're just uh, quick, sketchy tests of different ideas that we might want to include in the plan. Next slide. I uh, want to make a distinction between different types of tools for scenario planning. Uh, there's uh, it, there's a, this distinction between heavyweight models and lightweight sketch planning tools. Heavyweight models are things like travel demand models that are used by MPOs to measure greenhouse gas emissions or vehicle miles traveled. They're some of the climate change models that are used by IPCC or other uh, global organizations looking at climate change. Um, econometric models that try to estimate the, um, the impact or the, the reaction to a policy that an open market actor like a, a real estate developer uh, might choose to, to do. Or demographic forecasting tools that um, try to predict growth rates and uh, and deaths and, and in migration based on a set of factors that you feed them. Um, lightweight sketch planning tools, there are many of them, um, but in the realm of, of urban planning, there are really three big ones, uh, Vision Tomorrow, Urban Footprint, and Community Viz. Um, and Vision Tomorrow is a, a tool that I helped develop at a previous employer. It's a tool that we use uh, quite a bit. Um, community Viz was used um, as part of the last regional plan update, and the tool that we've settled on for this regional plan update is Urban Footprint. Um, they're all very similar in the way that they work, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but at a basic level, the, the differentiation between these tools and the heavyweight models is that uh, they are meant to be light and fast, 
um, not be super predictive and just um, enable you to get a sense of what a potential change to land use could do in terms of a range of different performance metrics and then, and then move on. Next slide. The other thing that's really um, different about these tools is that the heavyweight models tend to be more predictive. That means you feed them some inputs like um, the cost of gasoline or the um, availability of land or, the, uh, or a new transit network or a new road. And then they use statistics and other assumptions to predict what some response to that will be, either in terms of greenhouse gas emissions or how much driving there will be or how developers in a, in a real estate market will react. Whereas lightweight sketch planning tools, they require a, an operator or a user to show them what the future looks like. And then they just tell you what that means in terms of how much driving there might be. So um, you, you, don't, uh, you don't necessarily predict based on, on a set of inputs. You say, here's what the future looks like. Here's where growth happens. And here, and then it tells you, here's what that means in terms of density, in terms of housing costs, in terms of, uh, in terms of, of VMT and greenhouse gas emissions. Next slide. Um, these are not new tools. Uh, they've been under development for at least 30 years, if not longer. Um, the tools that we talked about earlier, Urban Footprint, Community Viz, Envision Tomorrow, um, they have very similar DNA in that they were all developed around the same time by people who are collaborating with one another. And they're all structured in a very similar way. Um, and all that is to say that these are not untested. Uh, they are tools that have been revised and, and made more useful over time. And, uh, and I, uh, I think that that shows up in, in the way that they operate today, that, that they're, they're very um, reliable. Next slide. There are a number of regions that were early adopters of some of these tools, mostly for big regional planning that was starting to, to happen in the late 1990s. Portland, Salt Lake City. I mean, if, you, if you know anything about scenario planning, you've probably heard of Envision Utah, which was the first big regional scenario planning process. Uh, they used a very early version of one of these sketch planning tools. Uh, Chicago, the Central Texas region, all of these were, were um, users of, of early versions of these same tools that we're using for this project. Next slide. Since that time, uh, these tools have been used all over the country for very different kinds of projects, not just regional plans. They've been used for city comprehensive plans, transit plans, small area plans. Um, I'm sure I'm not capturing nearly all of these. These are just ones that I've I've worked on or been made aware of. Um, so, so this is these tools are also not geographically specific. It's not as though they only work in one part of the country. Uh, they're designed to be flexible enough to work in places as different as Louisiana and Salt Lake City. Um, but I will say that one thing that ties these tools together that is that they were all developed in the West around issues of growth management. And those are issues that are very present in Flagstaff. And so I think uh, I don't think there's anything about this region that uh, makes these tools in some way not applicable. Next slide. So I'll just finish up here uh, and transition into Rachel's part of the presentation to talk a little bit about the tool that we are using for the technical aspects of scenario planning. So again, this is not a predictive heavyweight model. It does not take a set of uh, assumptions and then spit out a result, it requires you to actually specify where growth happens. And it does that um, by starting with a, what we call a base canvas, uh, which is basically a parcel data set for the region that has uh, data that comes from your assessor baked into it. Um, it has, uh, and then the, the, the way that you show it where growth is, is going to happen in a scenario is through painting what are called place types. 
these place types are comprised of individual buildings and roads assumptions and sewer and water assumptions. As Rachel will tell you, those are all have all been very well calibrated to this region. And by painting those place types onto parcels in the region in different ways, urban footprint can then generate scenario results. So these are things like how much, well, what's the den average density? What is the, uh, what is the amount of walking and biking? What's the greenhouse gas emissions profile of that scenario? Um, so that's what we're using um, to help so, to help kind of sharpen our picture of what different ways of growing could look like in Flagstaff. Um, we are pretty early on in this process, and there's still plenty of calibration or, or adjustments that we can make. Um, but um, I'll, I'll leave it there and pass it over to Rachel, who's going to show you a little bit more about specifically how this tool works. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I'll be going over our modeling tools and calibration, kind of our process. How do we go from the plans to the place types to the painting? Um, and then if any questions come up as I'm walking through the explanation, please put them into the Q&A or raise your hand and we can answer those. So a little bit about um, the calibration. We took a look at, um, we worked with city and county staff to catalog um, every single zone within the region. And we came up with um, a total of 76 county and city plan designations. And for each of them, we um, have a matrix shown here. This is just a representation of the full spreadsheet that we generated, but it um, includes uses. It includes things like maximum heights, maximum densities, um, maximum FARs. And so overall that gives us a good sense of the um, zoning designations within the region that we'll need to account for within urban footprint, but also um, in some cases, there are overlaps between them. And so we're able to um, look at the common, you know, between the city and the county or whatever the case may be, um, common designations and then combine them when needed. And we also, knowing the region and, and getting input from staff, um, account for things like activity centers and resource protection overlays, um, which may allow increased density or require decreased density over um, the base zone designation. And just want to point out that those have been accounted for within the work that we do. And so what we do is we take these and then um, identify developable parcels and assign them a regional place type based on these underlying characteristics of the zone designation. So we go through this whole process. If you think about our spreadsheet, we had 76 total rows with all of these attributes populated and we were able to distill them into a total of 20 regional place types. A little bit more about what is a place type. Um, we think of them as building blocks. So they represent the full range of existing and future land development patterns. Um, they include site size, typical. For all of these things, we're sort of um, making some assumptions about what a typical characteristic would be within a zone and then creating a place type. So they include densities, they include floor area ratio, land use, um, population, housing, employment, and streets um, as some examples of the attributes. And all place types are made up of a series of building types. So, you know, we can understand in a certain residential zone, not every single lot is gonna have the same development, the same exact type of house in a mixed use um, zone even more so. You know, we're gonna have a mix of different building types. Um, different employment densities, different residential densities from lot to lot. But overall, what the place types are allowing us to do is generalize um, through a combination of different assumptions of what would happen within that place type to hit a target um, overall employment and housing density and then housing mix, um, as well as industry mix for the place types that include employment. Um, so they allow us 
if you think about kind of, we'll talk more about what painting means, but as we paint um, future development, we are able to kind of generate that mix through the work that we do in urban footprint. Um, and included on this slide, so we took that first spreadsheet that I showed, showed on the previous slide where we have all the different zone designations, all the uses, all the different um, standards related to the zone, and then we distill them into different place types. And you can see you know, some examples where maybe um, one is called medium density residential with certain characteristics. And then there's another zone that's present within the region called single family residential neighborhood. These are some examples from the real um, zoning designations and they both have similar, similar characteristics um, so that overall we're able to assign the same place type to those two different zones, knowing all the you know, underlying information. And a little bit more about um, what is it that we're doing when we're painting? What we're doing is um, we operate uh, to hit what we call control totals. So we use to begin with, as Alex mentioned, um, what's called a base canvas. So we have an estimate you know, to start that um, there is a certain employment number and there's a certain population within our canvas, you know, the area of, of study for this project. And then um, we have worked with you all to um, kind of project out into the future some reasonable assumptions about um, future growth for employment and population. Um, and so projecting out to 2045, we hit what is called a control total. So we have a total number um, for employment and population that um, ultimately through our process of painting and adding um, population and employment throughout the region, we hit ultimately th those final numbers are what we're going for in our painting. And I'll, I'll kind of go through the details. Um, it's one thing to understand theoretically, but then I think when we go through the process, that'll help explain um, kind of how the numbers all relate to each other, how the zones relate um, and what, what the place types mean in the context of, of painting. Um, and then we, we again got some feedback on, on reasonable household sizes um, based on existing trends, um, as well as occupancy rates, knowing, um, you know, generally some housing characteristics in the region. And those have all been baked into the place types that we used and the assumptions that we used um, for our scenario and painting process. So a little bit more, um, since this is under the hood, we're really getting in uh, to the technical details because this is um, what was requested for the meeting. So um, in terms of this chart, we're really starting out with those place types, again, based on that big spreadsheet of the different zones and the different standards within those zones. And then to paint, um, we're going zone by zone within the entire region. And we've developed some selection criteria and I'll go into this in more detail, but um, generally we're looking only for vacant developable land. Um, we're taking into account area plans as well as recent development trends to make some reasonable assumptions about um, what the future would look like in the region. So kind of feeding all of those things in for those of you who work um, with any sort of query language or NGIS, um, you build a selection set based on different filters. And so we are feeding in those criteria to build a selection set. And then overall that gives us um, several parcels that meet those selection criteria. And once we are satisfied that we've selected the correct things, um, our assumptions are reasonable, all of our selection criteria makes sense based on the background information we provided, um, we paint. And that means that we are assigning place types to all of those selected parcels and essentially adding employment and housing on the parcels that um, we paint. And I'm just going into the Q&A just to make sure that I'm capturing everything. So I see from David, um, are there hypothetical place types that might not exist in today's zoning, say very high density? Um, and Alex, I don't know if you wanna chime in on that or- Yeah, so it. That's, a, that's a great question. Um, so at where we are in the project so far is that we're working 
on finalizing the business as usual scenario. And um, intentionally within the business as usual scenario, we limit ourselves to the, the coloring, the, the crayons that exist today. But in the alternative scenarios, yes, absolutely. There, we will be introducing new crayons to color with um, that aren't represented in what we would consider business as usual. So to pick back up, um, and I'll go through each of these steps in more detail, and then we'll actually see them in Urban Footprint through a um, quick demo. But um, we use, again, the underlying zoning information, information about environmental constraints. Um, we paint, and then we keep track of what we're adding for each place type in terms of employment for the place types that include employment housing for the place types that include housing. And then we're always watching um, what we're adding as compared to our control totals so that we make sure overall when we're done painting, um, we've, we've hit those targets, we haven't exceeded them and we haven't um, underpainted so as not to hit them. So it's kind of a, um, it's a process that includes uh, refinement and revisions um, and erasing and repainting, um, but overall we kind of go through iterations, um, working through the different zones um, to get to our control totals. And um, again, just a little bit more on the place types. Um, we calibrated them looking at um, the existing zoning, existing types of buildings, things like height. So all of the building types within those place types adhere to what's allowed within the zone. Um, density and use mix assumptions as well are accounted for. And then um, again, we go through that selection process and I'll review that in more detail um, in a little bit um, to isolate the partials that might be appropriate for that place type. So what does this look like um, when we do it? And on the right, you can see, um, this is just a quick screenshot from the um, user interface and in urban footprint. So we go into our, what we call a scenario canvas. If you wanna just think of it as a map of all the parcels, that's kind of a simplified way to think about it. Um, and then we go in again saying, okay, I'm, put, I'm painting a certain place type, which, underlying zones do those does that place type correspond to based on that giant spreadsheet and so i know my zones which um, in our attributes are are um, contained in the z string field um, we have um, environmental constraints accounted for um, also within our attributes so we make sure that what we're selecting does not have any environmental constraints we only want vacant land. Um, again, this, these are all you know, underlying data sets provided to us um, for this project in GIS. And then we're also looking at access to utilities because you know, re if we're looking at realistically what is most likely to develop in the future, we wanna start with um, the parcels that have access to utilities, which um, are more likely to develop than um, those that do not. So using all of those things combined, um, again, for any GIS users, this should look fairly familiar where we have a map, we are highlighting parcels that meet our criteria. And then um, based on those selection criteria, um, we can apply a place type to that selection. And that's what um, we mean when we say we're painting. So each time we paint in Urban Footprint, we see some changes. Um, to the total population, um, the number of dwelling units and the employment numbers. And then um, kind of an, an, a subset of that information is we can also see housing mix and industry mix for the employment. So again, as we're painting, we're going through and we're checking against what all of our assumptions are for those control totals and making sure um, that what we're doing is reasonable based on those assumptions. And so um, the way that our painting works is each paint is applied to our scenario canvas. Um, and again, as I mentioned, you know, kind of in that previous example with the selection, we are um, just making sure that um, we're tying the selection to, again, the appropriate zones, we're eliminating environmental constraints. And um, when we're painting in areas that 
um, make sense based on the best available data for future development. And so what happens when we paint? Um, what happens in addition to having our selection set, and I'll, I'll get into this in the program, but we're just kind of giving you some background information about all of the different things we're seeing on our dashboard and urban footprint. So you can see um, this image to the right um, shows me my selection and a lot of really helpful information about what, what it is. Um, so in this case, I've run that query that again, looks at the underlying zoning, the environmental constraints, the vacant land, um, and the utilities that are available. And so I know how many parcels I've selected, what the developable acreage is with, within that selection. And then I'm able to sort of draft a place type. In this case, I haven't committed anything. I'm just saying, okay, so in my selection set, um, if I applied our medium density, um, roughly 20 units per acre place type to the selection, what's gonna happen? And um, this summary view allows me to say, okay, I'm applying a residential place type in this case. And um, so I'm not adding employment, I'm only adding um, population and housing for this selection. Um, and these numbers in gray under population, if you can see it says, you know, nine in gray under population. So that's telling me what my base um, canvas has. And then um, if I were to add this place type, the number in black is showing me, okay, I'm adding roughly um, or, or exactly 4,748 4, um, total people would be in that um, area. And I'm adding, you know, just under 47,000 or 4,750 um, to that parcel. And again, also I'm adding about 2,500 dwelling units based on the selection. I'm actually in this case selected an area that has a very few jobs according um, to the information we have. And I'm, I'm just zeroing that out. I'm making this all residential development. Um, you can see on the right here that um, in, in gray is the base. So that's, you know, telling us again, our, 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 our base canvas um, basically existing conditions um, has certain numbers and then in green is what we think of as the increment. So in that case, that would be everything that I've painted. And so um, I can see when I hover over that uh, within the software, I can see exactly how much population, how many dwelling units, how much employment I've added. I can see dwelling units by type. So again, the housing mix, does that align with our assumptions? Depending on the place type, I could be adding um, a lot of certain types of housing. And I just wanna make sure that makes sense when I'm doing this. And then again, um, the employment sector mix, um, we're able to tell if we're adding a place type that includes employment, um, that that uh, aligns with our assumptions. And so um, once that selection has been made and those parcels have been painted, um, we look, you know, once I hit paint, all of those numbers, you know, in the black become reality as reflected um, in what we've painted. And so then we take a look, okay, how, how close are we to our control totals? Um, or have we exceeded them? And in, in some cases, do we maybe need to unpaint some areas? Um, are we not hitting them and we need more of certain types of housing, more jobs somewhere? So it's kind of like a, um, again, like an iterate iterative process where we're adding, um, in some cases, um, unpainting when needed to, to hit those control totals. Um, so I'll pause again. We just kind of gave you a very detailed technical explanation or any questions coming up about any of that, that that anyone has, feel free to raise your hand or put it in the Q&A. I'm not seeing any questions. So in that case, um, feel free, you know, again, if, if, if things are coming up as I'm going through or you're curious about anything, just, just uh, put it in the Q&A. But um, I will go through just a very quick example of what this looks like in the software. Um, I'm going to reshare my screen. So you can see um, in this case, 
I have, um, this is just kind of one example row of um, our P type, so our place type to our um, zoning matrix, how we know, okay, if I'm thinking about painting, in this case, the medium density residential um, place type, what are the underlying criteria that I need to be putting into to get that selection set? Um, another thing we looked at is just um, recent permitting data. And we took a look at, um, you know, overall, we had to make a lot of assumptions about this, but just generally, what are the average unit sizes for this type of place type? Um, if we were to extrapolate projections about um, development, of in these zones, what what, me, what might we expect to see um, if trends follow kind of the same trajectory, just to help us kind of normalize and, and um, know that what we're doing would be a reasonable assumption. And then um, within urban footprint, what this looks like. Um, so I'm just gonna go into, um, Check a question. Oh, I'm just going to take a question from Sharon. Um, in the meantime, before I get into the next step with an urban footprint, so how are the employment types matched to the housing types? Given the high cost of housing here and low salary wage slash wages, is the dominance of single family homes realistic? Um, and I think. Um, that's an excellent question in terms of the scenario development. Um, and I don't know, Alex, if you want to chime in on that. Um, but really, um, to begin with, we are just assuming that things continue as they have and following the current trends. And then I think as we develop our scenarios, we'll be able to dig into questions like the one that you posed, Sharon, more about, you know, is it realistic? Given um, the employment mix and the cost of housing that this might continue in this way. Anything to add, Alex? Yeah, so just, just in terms of the, the technical mechanics of it, we're painting zone by zone, and we are um, we are also looking at where building permits have happened over the last 10-ish years by zone. And so zones that have available land and where lots of development has happened in those zones in the last 10 years. Those are zones that are gonna get more development in this, in our business as usual scenario. Um, so that could be uh, a lot of retail and a lot of single family homes. Um, and that would be what the, that might, might be what the trends show. I would say that to, to the second half of your question, is it realistic? Uh, it could be. Uh, there are certainly lots of uh, communities that have a high prevalence of remote workers, tourism driven economies, um, and high housing costs where uh, much of the growth in the workforce is in lower wage uh, sectors, and those workers aren't able to live locally, and they end up commuting quite a long distance in order to serve the needs of the higher income residents who don't tend to work locally. And that's a major issue that we think this, our business as usual scenario, not to get too detailed, that's not what this meeting is about. Um, we're talking more about the tools generally, but just to give you a window into what these tools are telling us. As we get into this business as usual scenario, we're seeing that uh, there, there is potentially uh, that issue is starting to crop up, that you already don't house many of your workers within the region that commute in from outside. And we know from looking at other uh, regions with even higher housing costs that uh, it, it, it does happen that even fewer workers may be housed locally and may be commuting from far away. So it's an interesting question, um, uh, but hopefully that answers uh, at least the first part of it. And I see Sarah with a hand up. So Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, I wanted to just chime in on that with Sharon that the, the real purpose of this modeling is to test ideas so, and to see if the, the impression we have about those ideas actually plays out. So like for instance, one of the impressions that the general public has um, and some members of the general public has is if we just keep 
Flagstaff the way it is, it'll get better and it'll still be a livable place. That's kind of what business as usual is testing. It's testing if we sit on all our past decisions and don't make any changes to how past decisions were made and what's on the books today, and we let the market and the trends play out within that landscape, what does that future look like? And so that's when we talk. So we will have other scenarios that test other ideas and say, what if we take that idea and try and make it into a future? And then we run it through the model and we see if that comes up with the results we expect or if it doesn't. And we have to then dig through it and try and have a better understanding of why. And that's what really can inform our policymaking as we move into those later steps of the process. So just wanted to throw that in there. Thank you. Yeah, that's that is, um, I think, some good perspective and additional information. So, truly under the hood um, here. This is if we are logged into Urban Footprint together. Um, we're looking at um, our scenario canvas, um, is what it's called, and I'm just going to take us through a selection and a paint for one place type. So um, it kind of comes to life a little bit over just looking at the tables. Um, so just as a form of review, again, I'm looking um, to paint my medium density residential, about 20 dwelling units per acre place type. Um, I need to know this Z string is really important. That tells me the, the underlying zones that I'm targeting with this. So I'm going to start with that. Um, the way that I do this is I'm able to do a join um, on the existing data that we have um, for the region. And then I'm able, again, for the GIS users, or if you're not, this is um, how we do it, where I'm wanting to see, okay, my RM20 um, slash A is one zone that I'm targeting here. And then, um, and this is, this is true to form as I toggle back and forth between my information and what I'm trying to do. So, um, I'm also looking at this additional zone that is in a um, RPO, um, so it would have uh, slightly lower density than the, the, the base zone. And you can see as I do that um, on the right here, I have my selection set and kind of the turquoise color is, is beginning. Um, and just, you know, in terms of what we're looking at here, um, if I go into this build tab, um, I just want to know what have I selected, right? What what's in here? And so far, I've selected around um, 387 acres, including um, 1,420 features. Um, currently, has a lot of population, a lot of dwellings, a lot of employment, and that's because I haven't done any of my other filtering. So I've just selected those zones. Um, but I what I need additionally. Um, to complete my selection is I want to know, okay, first of all, this is not an area that has environmental constraints. So I'm going to make sure in our case, we have um, a value of zero representing those environmental constraints. I also want to know um, much of what, you know, the kind of that base selection is includes developed parcels. And I don't think it's reasonable to assume that most of those are going to redevelop. So in this case, I'm only looking at vacant land. And so, um, I'm not quite done with my selection, but just for the sake of explanation, I'm going to go back and show, okay, so once I put those, you know, constraints in and I'm only looking at vacant land, well, I have um, much fewer parcels selected. That's a much more reasonable assumption about future development. Um, right now I have around 100, 137 acres um, with very little population, very few dwelling units, very few employment. So this is telling me, okay, everything is correct in terms of my assumptions about vacant land. And then lastly, um, I'm just going to add in that utility score again for kind of what is a reasonable assumption about um, future development. So I'm going to put that in. And then ultimately, here is um, what I feel pretty good about as my selection set. Um, and then this is how we apply place types. So in this case, um, what I am trying to do is make an appropriate selection for that medium density residential around 20 units per acre place type. So when I go to kind of draft 
that type for painting, I'm seeing, okay, if I do this, I'll add um, around 4750 people, around 2500 dwelling units. Um, I can see the areas, you know, we do a lot of spot checking as we're doing this to make sure, does this make sense? Is there infrastructure? Um, that sort of thing. Are they, you know, uh, avoiding those environmental constraints? We make, we know that our filters should be fairly accurate, but we do do spot checking um, just to make sure that this is a reasonable assumption. And then, um, you know, you can see, so this is a this is a canvas, um, in this case, just a demo canvas for the sake of this um, demonstration where I haven't painted anything on this canvas. So you can see my all of my base numbers are here um, in gray. And then when I paint, um, go ahead and hit that paint 22. I'm gonna apply that place type um, to these parcels. I'll give it um, a few seconds to populate. And then what happens is I start to get an increment. I see, okay, I, I have painted, um, in this case, that place type, and I'm, I'm starting to see in green, I've added, um, you know, 827 single family detached units, around 1100 um, single family attached. So maybe duplex units, a little bit of multifamily around, 556 units. In this case, it was a residential type, so no employment. Um, but that's really what there is to, to it. We go through for every place type. Um, we try to, again, make sure that um, ultimately these increments that we're hitting um, at the end of our process are equivalent to those control totals um, in terms of what we're, what we're trying to add based on projections in the region. So I will pause here. Um, we're gonna go back to the presentation just to um, summarize some kind of additional things that we can do once we've painted, but any, any questions coming up for anyone based on seeing this? Okay, and I see David has a hand raised. Let me... or that might have been was unintentional. <laughs> I think it went away. Oh, there you, okay, go ahead, David. Yeah, so um, if you were, if you overshot your control total, um, are there uh, parcels um, that are prioritized uh, that help you make the decision on what to unpaint? Yes, that is an excellent question. Um, so a lot of this process for our business as usual involved, okay, here's Cascadia's best bet based on everything that I just talked about. But if we have city and county staff reviewing it and seeing, um, maybe there's some areas that they know something about that we didn't have that information. So they'll point out, okay, no, it would never make sense for that to be there. Um, and so part of the revisions that we've done are based on that. In other cases, there might be a very, very large parcel that comes up in the selection set that may, you know, skew things radically one way or another, and maybe we unpaint that um, for the sake of, you know, reasonable assumption. So yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of fine tuning, um, but in general, through the staff review and feedback is where we kind of get our best information. Um, we also took a look at the development pipeline just to make sure, particularly for things like multifamily projects that we're capturing the appropriate densities um, and unit numbers approximately in our painting because um, there's a little bit of a lag between, you know, kind of the 2019 information and then the future projections. So um, hopefully that answers your question. Other questions? Not seeing any. So I'm going to go ahead and um, continue the presentation and just ask Alex to come back in to talk about the analysis modules and some additional calculations that we made based on painting. Yeah, thanks, Rachel. Um, and this is related to a question we got from Busy um, about whether Urban Footprint has transportation inputs or outputs. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, um, to answer that question, there are a number of, of outputs that Urban Footprint can calculate. It's not so great on the input side. So it does not allow you to feed in, for instance, a new road network or transit network to see what the results of that would be. That's something that would have to happen 
uh, off model or using some other tool like the regional travel demand model. Um, but to get a basic understanding of how land use alone is influencing, for instance, BMT, there is a module that Urban Footprint has that allows you to do that. Uh, it's called the transport module. There are a number of other modules that allow you to estimate things like uh, emissions, water use from, from buildings, um, how much uh, retail or parks access uh, exists for new development, that sort of thing. Um, these are fairly quick to run um, and there, there are quite a few of them. Um, uh, Rachel, if, if we could switch over to Urban Footprint, sorry to put you on the spot, but I'm going to have you demo a few other things here just, just quickly. Um, so if you go to the analyze uh, mode on the left there, one more up from that one. Yep, that one. So you can see there on the right, uh, are all of our analysis modules. And uh, they can be run just by hitting go. So every time we create a scenario, we can rerun these to see what the results are. Uh, but if you scroll over to where those analysis modules are, Rachel, uh, there's a little pencil icon. Maybe we can do the energy use one. So there are some parameters that we can edit within these and, and we have done that um, where appropriate to calibrate these models to local conditions. For instance, in the transportation module, or sorry, in the emissions module, we, uh, we looked up uh, 2045 projected fuel economy from um, USDOT, and we use that as our assumption for fuel economy in every scenario other than the existing conditions. Um, so that just gives you an idea of the kind of calibration we we can do natively within Urban Footprint. Whenever you run one of these modules, it produces uh, both tabular results and in most cases, GIS data. So Rachel, if you go to the report feature, uh, you can see that for each module that we have run, there are results that we can toggle between. Um, we've done a bunch of versions of the business as usual scenario testing different iterations of it. So you can ignore most of those. But the key is that as you go through different uh, modules, which are listed there on the left, there are different results for the entire scenario. Uh, but in addition to that, most of these modules will also create uh, a parcel based result that shows the result on each individual parcel. So for instance, the transport module will give you VMT for the entire scenario, but it'll also show you VMT on a specific parcel. Um, and those can all be exported and, and manipulated in ArcGIS or some other tool as, as the user sees fit. Um, that's important because um, if you go back to the presentation, uh, Rachel, in the next slide, some of the uh, indicators that we'll want to produce aren't going to come natively out of urban footprint. They are going to be things that we want to calculate uh, using a more flexible tool like ArcMap. Um, and so just to, to show you that it is possible to download the, re the results of a scenario, not just the parcel data with paints applied to it, which you can certainly download, but also the results that come out of an analysis module. So I, you could download the parcels that, um, that, that have VMT uh, associated with them for each parcel that are the result of running the transport module. And I know that, uh, I don't know if there are any folks from, from the water, the Flagstaff uh, Water Department on the call, but there's been some desire to um, run a more specific calculation of water use based on zones within the city or the region and estimates of water consumption by zone, which Urban Footprint, it can't see. Yeah, but if we bring our results into a GIS like ArcGIS, uh, and then we bring in those zones, we can do whatever off-model calculations we like. Um, so it's, it's flexible in that regard. So that is that is everything that we were uh, hoping to show you.
Um, and we've got about eight minutes remaining before the top of the hour and we have to sign off, but any questions until then? Well, if, if, uh, if you do have, well, hopefully, I guess, first off, hopefully this has been helpful uh, and has, has uh, given you that, that under the hood view that we know that some folks were looking for. Uh, looks like there's a few questions coming in. Uh, thank you and very helpful. Good, glad to hear it. Um, you know, ultimately these tools are not, um, they're not overly complicated. They're not meant to be a black box. They're basically just a land use calculator. You know, we are, the work that we do to calibrate the place types to local conditions, that's the key. Because with any of these tools, if you feed it junk information on the front end, you're gonna get junk information coming out of it. But we feel very confident that we've done a very, very deep dive into at least what's allowed today so that what we're painting is, fits within that, that envelope. Um, and, and beyond that, it's, it's all just pretty simple, multiplying densities against acres. Um, one thing I, I forgot that I wanted to also highlight, Rachel, if you could switch back to the, um, the urban footprint uh, window there. If you uh, go back to the analyze pane, and then you go all the way over to one of the modules, each of these modules, if you click the three dots off to the right, um, has actually, yeah, they have a methodology white paper associated with them. So if you click that, um, we'd be happy to share any of these with folks. Um, they are also available um, on through Urban Footprints website. Um, but there's there's pretty good documentation of each individual module. That's really the only black boxy element of this is that there are these things, these models that we feed a scenario into. They they churn and run and then spit out results, right? Um, those are a little harder to explain, but these, these white papers that Urban Footprinters have produced are very detailed and give you all kinds of, of um, information about how each of the modules works. So happy to share these with, with any of you. Also know that if you go to the, the documentation section of Urban Footprints website, they are all available there to you if you want to dig in further. And I see that David has a hand up. Go ahead, David. No, that's just me being lazy and not taking it down. Sorry. Your hand must be very tired. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Well, if there are no further questions, we'll let you get get out of here five minutes early. Um, and I'd say if, if anything comes up, please direct those questions to Sarah and then she can get those to us. Um, but, uh, but otherwise, thanks for your attention today and getting in the weeds with us and we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. And we will share out um, the meeting recording if you have colleagues who weren't able to make it today or there's anything that you wanted to review. Thank you, everyone.